Vem kis kantris kudmenen el el gekim soltia el wikigartia nga el wikisoltia. Today we're going to learn on how to read in the language and how to write in the language. Um, a long time ago, um, in growing up, we didn't have our language written per se. We um, we learned how to read and write in English, but we never learned how to read and write in our own language. So lucky for us, we had some dedicated people who wanted to give those uh, rights to our language. Uh, people such as in the 60s, Dr. Peter Paul from Woodstock First Nation worked with Carl Teeter from Harvard and uh, started to develop a, uh, a writing system. And uh, of course, uh, what uh, Carl Teeter did is he recorded Dr. Peter Paul's stories. Those stories were left behind, and in 1971, uh, Dr. Wayne Wolf uh, worked with Kenneth Hale at MIT and were able to take those stories and start developing um, a, you know, a, a, a writing system. Uh, Eve Giddard was also from the Smithsonian and was one of the helpers in making sure that there was a writing system for peasant body maladies. In 1972, Robert Levitt and Philip Lesord out of the University of Indiana and Laura Necht uh, worked on the writing system and um, when, when people say, you know, sometimes you'll see people refer to a writing system as the Levitt system. Uh, that's basically incorrect because Robert didn't design it uh, all alone. Uh, this was total collaboration, you know, from elders and linguists, and uh, and that's how it was developed. So it doesn't belong to a linguist; it belongs to the people who share the stories. And I really want to um, uh, point that out so that when you're learning the system that I'm about to teach you. It's actually a passing body analysis writing system. Uh, as much as um, we'd like to give it to Robert, uh, we do give him credit for helping it to bring it to uh, us here in New Brunswick. Elder scholars, David Francis Sr. was the key um, elder uh, in residence who was helping with the uh, pronunciation, enunciation, and uh, tenses and, uh, and just how the language was used. The other ones from Zibai were Mali, Mary Ellen Saka Basin, Anna Lola Harnwa, Madak Negro, Marjorie Curley from Nebutkuk, and Maxine uh, Toma from Nebutkuk, who was uh, living in uh, Madak Negro at the time. The key features of the language that you have to remember is um, uh, when linguists were putting the language together, linguists have to use what they call diacritic marks, meaning they have to do symbols. And sometimes the symbols are just like when I remember learning how to read in English was you'd have a little, um, you know, a little mark telling you that it's a short vowel or a long mark telling you it's a long vowel. And the same thing happens when you're trying to, when the linguists were reading our language for the first time, they use what they call a schwa. A schwa today is known as the abuchkali e or upside down e. All that schwa is symbolizing is that it's half a syllable. So it's a uh, uh, so you can barely hear it. And uh, uh, so it replaces the o sound. So whenever there's a o like in the word abas, o p o s, then it's a. Uh, so it's just half that sound. Um, the use of an apostrophe is also used. You'll never see double vowels. You will see double consonants. But what the apostrophe does, it tells you how to uh, distinguish whether it's a hard sound or a soft sound. And what I mean by hard or soft is when you're when you're um, sounding out words and your voice box vibrates, that's a hard sound, like the J. But when it doesn't vibrate, it's called the soft sound, and it's ch. So you can barely hear it, so your voice box doesn't vibrate. So that's one way of distinguishing whether it's a hard sound or a soft sound. 
<clears throat> now, granted, people have always thought, why should we write the language? It's very important to write it. How else are we going to preserve it? We don't have enough speakers that are going to be around to be able to keep the language alive. So we need written documents. We need written materials. And, uh, and we need a writing system. Uh, initially, some of the documents that you see from the 1700s and the 1800s were phonetically written by the person who was documenting. Uh, what happens is when you use phonetics, we don't necessarily hear the same sound, so there is no consistency on it. And it's really important to have a spelling consistency. So for example, um, in English, we're always upset with ourselves when we misspell something in English. We should feel the same way when we're learning how to read and write in Maozi Passamkwadi because it deserves the same honor that English does. So we need to uh, know the writing system. That way we have a consistency in learning how to spell it. So some questions are why is one letter used to represent both voiced and voiceless? Uh, it just tells you so when you see it next to a vowel, it's going to be a hard sound. If it's next to a consonant, it's going to be a soft sound. So it's, um, uh, I'm just going to go to, um, I'm just going to go to the uh, consonants. The consonants, the consonants are um, C, K, P, Q, S, and T. Now, these are the six consonants you're going to need to remember because those are the consonants that's going to tell you whether it's voiced, meaning hard, or soft, meaning voiceless. So, the voiced consonants uh, are, are the ones next to a vowel. The letter C is going to be pronounced like a J, J, okay? Like in the word jaws. C-A-L-S, jaws, which means grasshopper. So that C is going to be hard because it's next to a vowel. But when that C is next to another consonant, like in the word chkui, C-K-U-W-I, chkui, then that C is going to be soft and it will be ch hardly hear it. So you go j for the hard sound or ch for the soft sound. The k follows the same pattern. The k is going to sound like a g, a g sound, like in the word ginak, which means uh, warrior. Ginak, and it's spelled k-i-n-a-p. Ginak, so that K is going to be G, Gina. But when that K is next to a, another consonant, like in the word uh, skidak, it's S-K-I-T-A-P. Then it's going to be pronounced sk, skidak, skidak. So that K is softer, sk, skidak. The P follows the same pattern. When the P is next to a consonant, like in the word, uh, uh, ni, uh, like in the word vajadis, and it's spelled P-O-C-E-T-E-S, vajadis, then that P sounds like a B, so it's B, vajadis, but when that P is next to another consonant, like in the word P-S-A-N, P -S -A -N, then that P is softer, P-S-A-N, P-S-A-N, which means it's snowing. The Q follows the same thing. So when the Q is next to a vowel, then it's going to have the hard voice sound like a GW sound, what, what, like in the word wind, spelled Q I N O T E, 
wind, but when that Q is next to another consonant, like in the word besk, P-E-S-Q, which means number one, then that Q is like a K-W sound, besk, besk. Your S follows the same pattern. When your S is next to a vowel, like in the word zagam, which means chief, it's spelled S-A-K-O-M. That S is going to sound like a Z or a Z. Zagam. So it definitely makes your voice box vibrate and you're going to hear the hard sound Z. But when that S is next to a, a another consonant, like in the word um, uh, mitz, mitz, which means to eat, it's spelled M-I-T-S. So that uh, the T is another consonant, so it softens the S, mitz, mitz. So it's a softer sound. Last but not least is the letter T. Your T, when it's next to a vowel, like in the word dhamma, T-A-M-A -A, meaning where, dhamma, then that T is pronounced like a D, dhamma. But when that T is next to another consonant, then it gives it the voiceless soft sound, like T, T, like in the word wast, wast. So those are your sounds. I'm just going to go through them again. Your C is going to sound like a J or a J, as in the word jolts. But your C is going to be soft when it's next to another consonant. Chkui. Chkui. Your K is going to sound like a G, a G sound, like in the word Gina, which means my friend. Ginap, K I N A P, but it's going to have the soft sound like in the word skida, skida, which means man. Your P, bajadas, bajadas, and the P is going to have the soft sound in the word sun, sun. Your Q is going to sound like a GW, winde, winde, which means really, winde. But your Q is going to sound like a KW, besk, besk. Your S is going to sound like a Z or a Z, as in the word zagam, but it's going to have a soft sound as in the word mitz, which means to eat. And last but not least, the T is gonna sound like a D, like in the word dhamma, where, dhamma, T-A-M-A, -A, but it's going to sound like a T, like in the word wast, W-A-S-T, wast, and it means snow that has fallen. So those are the six consonants that you have to remember. C, K, P, Q, S, and T. Now, when we, when we go to um, the vowels, okay, um, A, E, I, O, U. And their A is pronounced A, your E is pronounced E, your I is pronounced E, your O is pronounced U, and your U is pronounced U. A, E, E, A, O. So in the A, like in the word ahas, ahas, it's, you, you, you know, you remember that the, um, it's like the English word father, 
F A T H E R, you know, and so it's a, a hops. Your E is E, as in the word red, R E D. So it's a E, red. Like in the Maliseet word, uh, espens, espens, which means raccoon, espens. Your I is like the English word ski, so it's pronounced E, like in the Maliseet word ini, ini, which means to pray, ini. I am I, Ini. Your O is pronounced uh, uh, like in the word a bun, O P A N, which means bread, a bun, a bun. Your U is that uh, O, that O sound, almost like a double O sound, but it's O, like in the word O. Oo, which means fog. Oo, so what we're going to do is just practice some of those sounds now. And uh, a hops, a hops, espens, espens, eeny. Eeny, a bun, a bun, oon, oon. Now, some things to remember about the sounds is um, is uh, to make sure that you uh, know that there's also vowel blends. Vowel blends mean exactly what it says. It's a vowel blended with another sound. In English, they're called diphthongs, which is like an I-E sound. It's just one sound. It's two letters, but one sound. Well, now see, Pasmapati has the same idea, but we call them vowel blends. The first one is A-W, and it's pronounced ow. Ow, so you go with that ah sound and then mix it with the w ow, like in the word out, a w t, which means road. Out. Your e w is pronounced l, just like the you know remember the sound of the e is e and w, so it's l, like in the Malasi passing body word nel, which means number four. So it's ow. L. Your I W is pronounced ill. Ill. Remember the I is pronounced like an E, and then with the W it's ill. Like in the words for spring, zigwanil, spelled S I Q O N I W, zigwanil. Your A Y is your fourth vowel blend. And it's pronounced I, like in the word Zabai, S E P A Y, which means this morning. Zabai, so it's I. Your E Y is the last vowel blend, and it's pronounced A, like in the word Bile, which means new, spelled P I L E Y, Bile. So your vowel blends again are ow, l, il, i, a. And uh, your just as a, a refresher, your um, c k t q s and t are your consonants that you have to remember. Those are the ones that give you the two sounds, whether they're hard or they're soft. And all you need to know is whether they're next to a vowel or next to another consonant. The remaining consonants, which are H, L, M, N, 
W-Y have only one sound each. They sound just like they do in English. So you don't have to remember anything about them except they sound just like in English. Your H is pronounced when it comes before a vowel. So for example, in the Malasay Passant Party word, H-O-K, hug, you, you hear that H just like you would in English, hug. But when you see the H after a consonant, it's silent, like in the word whip, you know, or um, when you say uh, you don't really hear that H, but that H is present because the A gets longer. So it's silent, like in the word it's spelled M-O-C-I-M-A-H-T-E. If the H wasn't there, then you'd be saying Mijimare, and that wouldn't be the right word. So you need that H to lengthen that A, but so it's silent, but it still does a job. So like I said, the L is just like in English, like the word Lamil, which means within. Your M as in the word Ehem, E-H-E-M. Your N as in Nil, meaning I, me, or my. Your W as in West, you know, W-A-S-T. And your Y as in uh, Yud, Y-U-T, meaning here. Some rules, when you see the first person N referring to I, me, or my, when one of the six consonants, remember they're C, K, P, Q, S, and T, follows an initial N indicating the first person, it remains voiced, even though it's next to the N. For example, Jichin, my thumb, it's N, C, I, H, C, I, N. And as we just talked about the rules, you would say, well, I thought the C was going to be silent because it's next to a uh, next to a, uh, another consonant or soft because it's next to another consonant. It's when it's in front of the letter, when it follows the first person N, it's still going to be hard, so it's pronounced G chin. G chin. My hand B tin. N P I H T I N. So that uh, it's still going to be hard, so it's going to be pronounced uh, like a being beaten. <clears throat> Remember, two vowels never occur together in any word. If you hear two vowels in sequence, use a Y or a W, like in the word badgie, P E C I Y E. Badgie. So it just means that somebody has arrived. And when any vowel is followed by H in a consonant, its sound is its sound is lengthened and modified to sound like English a as in hat. A fit is an example. E H P I T. A fit. So that H lengthens that E okay, and softens that P. A fit. Maxi. M E H S I. So it lengthens that E. Maxi. Why? So there's lots of words that give you these examples. Uh, using the apostrophe is very important. It's used to distinguish voiceless at the beginning of C, K, P, Q, S, and T only. It doesn't go in the middle of the word. It doesn't go at the end of the word. It's only used in front of those six initial consonants because those are the same consonants that remind you about two sounds, whether that consonant is next to a vowel or another consonant. But when you see the apostrophe, like in the word tamawe, it's spelled apostrophe T-O-M-A-W-E-Y. And that indicates that initially there used to be a W in front of that word. And so what happens is there's a, sometimes letters are dropped, but as if you're following the rules and you see that T O M A W E Y, you're automatically going to pronounce it the Maui. But that apostrophe is telling you 
No, no. Uh, in this case, it's going to be soft because this apostrophe is reminding you that there used to be another letter here, Putamali, but it's now pronounced Tamale. We also use it in the word water, Samawan, because sometimes people pronounce it Zamawan. And so when they do that, you don't need the apostrophe, you spell it S A M A Q A N. But when you hear people pronounce it Samawan, then you'll use the apostrophe S A M A Q A N. So, uh, and uh, recently hyphens have been used uh, to keep the word, you know, uh, um, uh, consistent. Um, one of the things that people would say, like, if the word sounds like a, you know, a G, then why not use a G? I always use the example of the English word electric. We spell electric, E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C. -E Nobody says, well, how come the C is used, but the sound is a K? You know, you don't see people spelling E-L-E-K-T-R-I-K. -E -E Maybe some people do, but, so then when you take that word, and then you use the word electricity, we spell it E-L-E-C-T-R-I-C-I-T-Y. We don't say electricity. So the reason that we use these six consonants is to keep consistent and the spelling consistent in related words. Very important. And once you know those six uh, consonants, your vowel sounds, et, uh, et, E, A, O, your vowel blends, ow, L, ew, I, and A, then you'll have no problem writing our beautiful language and saving it for the ones who are not born yet. Nitepsil, Bugiwan, Ablasamwes, 